Well, we're here at the sawmill and we're going to start at the, uh, I'm not sure if this is the business end, the beginning of it, or the uh, maybe the, the saw is the end of it, most likely. So this is a place where we start off with the, the getting the horsepower through fire and wood. And we're talking to who? What's your name again? My name is Matthew Myers. All right, Matthew. I've talked with you before, right? Yes, sir. Are you the, uh, the, the head crew member here? I'm uh, one of the more senior members on the boiler. The other members are uh, Frank Tower here, and then Alex Sharp is the head uh, oh, okay. fireman on, on the All crew. All right. Because I've talked to you, and it's great. Do you go to school down south? I do go to school down south. I'm uh, currently in aircraft mechanic school right now. Right. Down in uh, Mira Mesa, California. Oh, that's great. So, looks like uh, this were this is probably the hottest part in the uh, in the fairgrounds right here at this boiler. I think I'd have to agree with you. Okay, and of course uh, you're putting up uh, what, what head of steam? Is that where you're keeping it at? A hundred? We're trying to keep it around about 105 psi. The safety lifts at 111. And uh, we try to keep it b between about 103 to 108. Um, keep a consistent amount of pressure for the Sawyer to provide power to the saw. Okay. Now, you like coming back here uh, year after year. What is it that draws you to this? I guess the climate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we really love working here and we love volunteering. We enjoy the people. We enjoy the fair. Uh, I guess I've been addicted ever since. Okay, it is a it is a great uh, great great fair and a lot of fun. Probably working with a piece of machinery that's uh, this thick and old and I don't know. I just really like the old stuff. I like the way the I like the way the stuff was done. Like I don't know, this is probably before the turn of the century, but uh, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, it was uh, pretty cool. What do you think? It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of history, and it's just fun to bring it to people where they can see how everything was made back then and that's what America needs right now you know what, what gets me sometimes is that you know when I uh, see all the stuff that we have today and everything and then I I, uh, I see some of this stuff and I go like wow does anybody even know how to you know build this stuff or make this stuff anymore it's as, as, as big as it is and uh, not cumbersome but it's just fascinating in its size and scope like it blows me away and of course there are people that can do it and maybe it's a step backwards but in a way it seems to me it was almost at the, the height of something yeah yeah it's a step forward this is this is what they used to do this is the pretty much the first step that they did and without this we wouldn't have houses today and all kinds of stuff. It's pretty cool too because it's labor intensive so there's a lot of a uh, lot of jobs, a lot of things for people to do. Uh, you start at the bottom, work your, sale, work your way up uh, to something, probably in a sawmill. I don't know if you'd start from the boiler or maybe get to be the sawer or if you wind up staying on this mechanical end or whatever, but uh, uh, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting and it's very fun. Okay, and good talking to you. And of course, this is like the you're, you're using the scrap wood that they cut to uh, to keep the boiler going. Yeah. This all this wood we burn right now is scrap wood from last year, so it's seasoned. If we try and burn the wood that they cut this year, it's going to be too wet and it won't it won't fire hot enough. So we uh, we keep a lot of it stockpiled, and then we save it for the next year or the next time we, we fire up. So that way we keep good hot boiler and we, we can keep pressure. Okay. Now I want to ask you something. Like I was a newbie like me or whatever in here and. Uh, trying to keep this thing going in a hunter would it be difficult for me do you just have like so much experience or I mean like would I maybe get that fire too hot throw too much wood in and uh, it's very likely it's it's a uh, it's a delicate balance finding finding out what the boiler wants and being able to balance your water level and then keep the pressure up as well if, if, I, if I would make too much of a flame and everything how would you dampen it down or cool it off well, if say if you're climbing in pressure too quickly because of too much flame, you can damper the fire down down here and yeah, actually okay. slow the air down into it. The other thing that you do is when you start climbing closer and closer to the your maximum pressure limit, then you inject water into the boiler, which will cool your head of steam okay. down and, and, and it uses steam to uh, to inject as well, so it'll drop your pressure a little bit. If you put too much water or something in there and uh, and uh I don't know, maybe exploded or 
do stuff like that? Well, your, your biggest concern with too much water would be uh, actually sucking it into the engine if you get if you get the water level too high, but it it would take a lot to do that. Um, your other concern is having too little water, which once again, in a vertical boiler like this, it's very difficult to do that. If you run it, you know, if you run a boiler out of water, then you're really in trouble. Okay, so that's a vertical boiler, and in a way, like, if it was laying down, then it would look more like an old steam engine, like yeah. a train? Yeah, very much like a traction engine or a locomotive. Um, those tend to be more efficient because uh, they carry more heat through them and it's in it longer, whereas this takes it up and shoots it out the stack real quick. But these heat up faster and come up to steam faster, so they're desirable in the logging situations where they needed power quick. All right. Well, uh, once again, nice talking with you, and uh, thanks for uh, filling us in. Well, here we are in the sawmill. We started with a boiler. We're, uh, we're, we're back here now. We're, the, we're converting the steam into some mechanical energy, and uh, that's really cool. Let's see if we can talk to somebody who knows about this. How you doing? What's your name? Uh, Matthew. Does the blue hat mean anything? No, it doesn't. It's mine. I brought it here. Okay, so you're not with the UN then? No, I'm not. Okay, great. And uh, so, what are you, uh, do you have a position here with, at, at yeah, uh, I'm a here. Today? And um, I just started yesterday. I volunteered and they brought me on immediately. So, Joe showed me the ropes of the uh, sawmill here. Okay, so maybe we talk to Joe and, and we can. Uh, find out a little bit more. Yeah, How's it going, Joe? Lee, I'm standing watch on the thing, and I really have to pay attention to what's going on here and out there. What is this, some of the things you're looking at? You can look at maybe... Uh, I'm looking at these belts to make sure they're staying on track. Uh, we're looking at the oil system. It has those cups that drip oil into the engine. Okay. You have to count how many drips per minute. And we're watching this valve gear to make sure everything's working right. And if there's a problem, I've got to shut it down real fast with this valve. Okay. Well, you keep looking at that, and we're going to go back here and uh, find out if this guy knows anything. I know you. How you doing? Pretty good, thanks. Tell everybody your name one more time. Uh, Phil Chris. Okay, and I want to make sure you don't want to go back in that wheel, but I'm sure you know your way around here. Okay, tell us a little bit about the flywheel here. That's kind of fascinating. Well, it weighs about, I believe, about 6,000 pounds. And uh, I, I don't know the diameter, but as you can see, it's, it's like three tons. Eight, eight or ten feet, yeah. And that keeps the, uh, the engine running at the same speed. It gives it momentum so that it, it uh, doesn't slow down and speed up when they're going through a log. That's right. the purpose of such a heavy, big flywheel. Yeah, kind of like in uh, physics, that gets that momentum going and wants to stay there. Yes, right. I want to go much faster and I want to go much slower. Right, so it just keeps kind of an even keel. Yeah, and it looks like maybe some of that gets uh, built up, uh, some of the differences, as we go down and seeing that tensiometer or whatever that's on the back there. Right, so when they're going through a log, it'll put a load on the engine, and the, the engine has to work harder and it starts slowing down, so the idler picks up the slack in the belt is what it does. That's the, why it's bouncing a little bit there. Right. Because the, it's pulling the belt a little bit and it's putting a little bit of tension on it so it takes that, that slack. Okay, so this is uh, really great. What, how old is this engine? What year is this engine? It was built in 1904. 1904. In Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. <laughs> wow, that's great. And where did it come from? Well, I mean, it, like, where are they it, 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 ran a, it ran a shingle mill up in Mendocino County. And, uh, but it was pretty much junk when they finally found it. The, the mill had shut down years ago. And how long has it been here uh, working at the sawmill? Well, they started, I think, in 93, and, uh, but it took a few years to get. They originally started with a, an old Dodge Hemi uh, car engine to run the sawmill. And then they, when they got this, they had to completely rebuild it from the ground up and then installed all the cement and put it together. I think it was 2003 when they finally got the engine running, actually running. I know a lot of people watching are really fascinated from the uh, out front there of the business end where it's cutting the logs. In fact, that's where most of the crowd is. But this is the part to me that's so uh, fascinating well, back it here. It's fascinating to watch one of these run. Yeah, there's not too many of them running anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, that's just really good. Well, good talking with yeah. you. And uh, thank you. I don't want to sound like Cal Osher or anything, but be careful back here, right? Oh, yeah, it's uh, you know, you're standing by here and you, you go like, damn, yeah, you have to. 
you have to know what you're doing here. Yeah, you don't want to get in the wrong you place. Wanna, you want to be sure-footed and not moving your hands or arms around too fast. Right. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Well, Phil, I've often seen uh, an, another engine here, and, uh, and I know I've talked about them and everything, but what? all of a sudden I'm not sure what this engine does here. What okay. does this one do? Well, this this is a Smith & Sayer bottle engine. It's a steam engine okay. because it looks like a bottle. It's cool and, looking. And what it does, it runs this belt up to this overhead shaft, and that goes all the way out to the saw, and then it runs the belt that runs the sawdust conveyor. It takes the sawdust out from oh, underneath okay. the, the saw, dumps it in a trailer or a pile or whatever we're doing down this, there. This part has been here for a long time. I just haven't noticed it that much. Well, no, it was put in probably three years ago. Okay. And they built all of this uh, overhead and, and all the bearings and everything, lined it all up and got it going. So it's fairly new to the sawmill. It looks like it's doing a lot of work, but I, I guess in a way with the pulleys and the shafts, it's uh, it's it's probably not doing a whole lot of work. You know what the horsepower rating on that is? No, I, I really don't, but it's not much. It's probably less than five or six horsepower at the most. What's, what's again, that's just so cool. I mean, I just love the belts and everything moving around. Yeah, it's they, like they, The old steam engines were all mechanical. There was, there was no computers on them. <laughs> I guess what's so cool about it, too, is like, you know, today and even back, you know, uh, even old cars, you know, you open up the hood and you really can't tell what's going on because everything's internal. Right. You know, move, all the moving parts are basically <laughs> inside right and you just get to see the fan belts or something but in here you get to see the, the pistons everything. working and the push rods yeah, and this is the, the pistons in here and it's fairly simple it just um the, the piston just goes up and down and runs an eccentric down there that runs the wheel and that's about it <laughs> this, just, is, this is a governor similar to the one that's on the big steam engine. And, but it's a, a fixed governor. You set it at a certain speed. Yeah, don't those balls or something come kind of come out there like yeah, centrifugal? They, they, it's a centrifugal force, and they'll come out to a certain point, and then that'll keep the engine from going any faster. Whereas this one here is a totally different system. It it actually govern, governs the intake on the valves, whereas this one just governs the speed. Well, we still have like uh, the big flywheel or whatever in the in the back of your uh, in the back of your car engine, you know, that so that's, uh, that's that goes up, the clutch goes through it, or yeah, I'm, I'm probably a, a kind of a clutch, even if you have an automatic transmi uh, transmission or something, right. too. So, yeah, to try to keep that that, that force, something you can work with. Right. That's just fascinating. And back down there, there's another uh, there's a, there's another engine. Actually, that's, that's working off of a tractor. It's working off of a That's just our cutoff saw that we cut the scrap lumber with to fit it into the boiler. That's well, all that does. Well, once again, that's belt driven. And I see the yeah. belt jumping around. I'm like, <laughs> it's so cool here. It's no one of the guys like to come around here and... I don't think at a, at a commercial plant they would allow you to run something like that, but this is historical. So it's uh, just like they did it back in 1900. <laughs> oh, right. Thanks again. Okay. And now I'm with Bill Braun. Bill, sawmills running uh, super today? Yep, we're running smooth. And uh, nice cool weather. I can't say that enough because... Uh, it really makes it comfortable. Yeah, this is one of those years that just, the gods have been good to us, you know, as far as the weather. It's cool, but not not too cool, and it's not hot, and of course, it just seems to be mixed. And for the viewers and everything, uh, you know, when you're cooler, I think you can uh, see and, and tell what's happening a lot better. I notice I've asked some questions that I don't normally ask. Uh, I, I think my mind's running a little cool. Yeah, well. <laughs> The attitude is cool down with the weather. Oh, right. oh. <laughs> here we go. So, what are we, what are we cutting up here? What's we're cutting down? most. This is all ponderosa pine. Uh, it's being reduced to all down to one inch, except for the inner inner part of the log, which will then they'll take out four by sixes or that's, four by fours. That's pretty good. That's like about a 16, 18 inch, 18 inch. Uh, Piece of wood there that just came off of that. Yeah, oh yeah. He's he's cutting probably close to 16s right now. Okay, and uh, so the guy on the red who, you know, what, what is his what is his job? The guy standing up. Well, he's the guy in the red shirt. He's a ratchet setter. Okay. Dave Bibby. He's been uh, doing this off and on over many years with us. As is the John Tower, the Sawyer, the man that operates the stick there to feed the carriage. And a lot of other guys up and down the line have been here for years. So uh, all volunteer. We have some newer people, younger people. 
transitioning in. Okay, so they probably have it to that dim dimension, and now are they going to cut uh, probably the rest of that log? Well, they're they're going to cut, it looks like, about a 12 now. Okay, now if somebody gives it, right, right, writes a list of what they expect to get out of that log or something. That's the, that Sawyer, that's the Sawyer's. Uh, that's the Sawyer's decision. He knows the species, and he's an old hand at the uh, on the on the stick there. Now John, who is normally the guy, he's training this younger fellow, Alex, uh, to how to handle the Sawyer's position. Okay. And this, you know, we always try to cross train to have the next guy backing up. And uh, then they, as they get more proficient, they hand off that position to them more and more. Okay. Now that saw blade, that's a, now that's a pretty big saw blade. That's 48 where, inch. Where, where do you, do you get that? And if, uh, if you needed another one, where would you get one? There's a company up in um, Portland, Oregon called Ho, H-O-E. They've been around since 1870s and still make saw blades. Uh, more modern saw blades, but they still supply these inserted tooth circular sawmill blades uh, like that one there. So if that one was to become damaged beyond repair, then we would buy a new one from them. And uh, they don't make these saws and keep them in stock anymore, but they still make them on order. Okay. Now I see uh, Ed Arata there, and of course Ed's from the water uh, in Sutter Creek. You know. I, I can remember going down there and watching them do the pours, uh, and that's about the same time period, right, from the, uh, the Sutter Creeks. Well, what's the name of that again? For some reason, Night that's just foundry. Assuming, right. The foundry down there, uh, the same time frame type, this sawmill and the foundry? Yeah, well, we started helping out here in the early 90s, around 93, and then the previous exhibitor, Roland Matson. Uh, handed it off to us in 90, after the 96 show and then we formed our own association in 2000 and it's been growing ever okay, since. That's a good answer and but I think I was... Uh, Ed Arata, yeah. I met him at the foundry. That's where I first got introduced to him. That's, that's what I did too, watching uh, drop uh, car engines and, and things like that well, into the... Yeah, uh, the, uh, the stripped down cast iron blocks right. and stuff like that and yeah. melt them down and pour them into various objects right. and that was fun but I guess I was saying the technology is uh, from about the same time period yes, right yeah yeah they all once again it's a fascinating uh, technology maybe it's because there's so much human activity involved in it and, uh, and the uh, openness of the of the engines and things where you get to see all the moving parts I guess yeah yeah this was a technology of a hundred plus years ago Fascinating, fascinating down here. Where do the where do the logs come from? Does, do, uh, do you purchase the logs, or uh, do, do people donate the logs? Yeah, uh, Sierra Pacific Industries, a local forester, Craig Ostergaard, facilitates that. This was actually came off Cal uh, California Division of Forestry land up near Dewdrop on 88. They had bug kill up there, and uh, the uh, logger up there. Uh, uh, working with SPI and CAL FIRE, got their bug trees out of their land up there, the parcel that they were concerned about, okay. and then they donated them to the sawmill group, and then Robert Dalton Trucking brought them down here, all free, all pro, pro bono, to support the uh, this exhibit. I just got a, I just got a, just got a great whip of a, now it's a chainsaw, but just a moment ago of the, uh, of the, uh, pitch you know or the oh yeah the, when yeah. it opens up the log yeah 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 this uh, sweet smell of fresh cut lumber oh, oh, beautiful. well uh, great great year at the fair have you had like uh, record crowds out here or anything like that yeah, watching well, yes Saturday is always our big day you know and uh, of course kids day on Thursday is a little light then we get a good a good bump up in when seniors day on Friday you know and then, of course, Saturday's the Bonanza Day. And we had them stacked out three and four deep out here yesterday. Okay, and uh, is this one of the only fairs that has a, a sawmill and expo and... Uh, well, it's the only one in California that we're aware of, okay? There are some antique sawmills uh, that are, don't, are not at fairs, right? Uh, one, uh, one is uh, over near Petaluma, uh, and then 
that's about it. Uh, do, do people that follow this this sort of a thing, uh, you know, uh, schedule a vacation or whatever? Have you ever talked to people oh, around yeah, this we, time we, to see this? Well, and, you know, the Hewell Hauser yeah. replay is still going on, and we every year since that time we always get at least a cut one or two or four couples come in and say, "Oh yeah, we saw that Hewell Hauser episode, and we thought we'd just come up and see it." Yeah. All right. So yeah, oh, yeah. Well, so that's. That's yeah. great, yeah. It certainly is. So, uh, thanks once again, and you know, and and of course, uh, just thanks for, you know, you have to like thank. It looks almost like you must have like over 50 people, maybe not out on the day, yeah. but a lot of people in your organization. How well, how many members do you have? We're pushing almost, almost 40. Okay. Uh, it's about 38, 37, right in that range. Okay. And well, let's, let's have like uh, one of the shifts down here. How many shifts do you have? Two? Well, no. What we do is we have other displays. We have the machine shop display. Okay. We have the steam doggy okay. display. We, of course, have, sell our, our homemade uh, alum, uh, furniture here made by the volunteers, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, so it's, it's kind of broken up. The mill is the main exhibit, but we have now these other exhibits that we bring in. Okay. Well, it really smells good in here. I hate to leave, but uh, we're, we're going to go on. Maybe we'll get some cotton candy smell next. Okay, Tom, okay. thank you. Thank you, Bill. Well, we're at a new addition to the fair. A lot of people think, like, I mean, nothing changes at the fair, but stuff changes at the fair, you know, a lot, especially over on this side. They add things to it all the time, and now this is a really old new thing. <laughs> old new thing. Yeah, that's putting it. Yeah. Anyway, this is typical. Yeah, it's, this is typical of what you'd find of a blacksmith shop that uh, circa 1880 to 1920 yeah, or so. Let me stop you right now for one second and tell us your name. I'm Jim Hall. Okay, Jim, and uh, I've heard your name around uh, for, from uh, Bill Brown and everything for uh, working with this historic group. And, you know, another fascinating thing, and this is the, we've all seen maybe the, the little blacksmith uh, set up or whatever. But this is a bigger thing. This is for uh, doing a lot of work, I guess. Huh? Yeah, this would be something you'd see more commonly associated with a sawmill or the machine shop. You got to understand, back when they had a sawmill like this out in the middle of nowhere, in order to keep it running, you had to have the machines to keep it running, and you had to have a blacksmith shop was part of that because you could, there was no place to order parts. You had to make them, and so this one here is set up. You actually have. A, a forge that has a two station forge so you can have two two people working here okay well tommy right now well, we'll get to this forge but tommy's over there looking at that is that what is that like kind of a, a press a cutter hammer. a drop hammer a drop okay. hammer and what that does is it runs off a, a, a make and break motor out and back with a flat belt and it goes around there's a cam and there's okay. a weighted head on it and there's an anvil on, on the bottom as that goes around it actually drops it and it takes the place of the man. Uh, the, uh, well, it gets uh, like to a place and it just gravity takes over and that bang, that, that bang. weight comes on down. Yeah. And, so it's and a, so is that to help hammer the hammer the metal? Yes. It's more force. It's less fatiguing for the the, the, the blacksmith. Right. And you can do different types of uh, anvils on there, different shapes and so on. So you could do uh, a lot more work with that hammer. And they, this one here is a, a kind of a small one, but they came in larger and uh, were used for a lot of okay. applications. And then, and then we come on up, we've got to see some anvils. It has a nice old light on it and then a, uh, a vise. That's a post vise, which is common to... Uh, uh, old early machine shops and blacksmith shops. Why would it be called a post vice? Because you set it up on a post or on a stump. Oh, so okay. it's designed to be put on the edge of a table or on a post or on. Uh, uh, so it could be set up next to uh, where their workstation was. And so it's easily accessible. You can see they're using their, their hot steel or iron. They go directly to the anvil or to that vice. It's within well, just a matter of very few steps involved. It's close at hand. Okay. And it looks like uh, maybe the blacksmith would have a couple of people that would be driving well, these uh, turbines. Or well, that could be. They could have an apprentice that's, uh, that's cranking or working the bellows. But typically in here, this one's designed for the blacksmith to be cranking with and keep this his, his uh, 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 material hot. 
uh, and then working it himself. So you can see there's two workstations on this particular one, and they're set up. And again, there's very little movement. There's it's quick from here to the from the hot metal from the from the forge to the anvil to the vice. So it's uh, okay. I'm not sure if, uh, if 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 there is one on the other side, but there's like a lever here. Uh, that but that opens that bottom down there. That opens that, that the, for a draw that or? for draw just the draw, but it also you can open it up to shed the see all that clinkers and stuff right. on the bottom there. You can it'll drop out of there. So right now they got a, a stick down there wedging up the door to keep it from. But anyway, okay. that's what that's for. All right, and. Uh, there's some newer, maybe newer thing. It looks to me like it's newer, just so it's lighter or whatever. That's you. That's used to lace belting. See, this is all flat belt uh, driven machines, and those belts come. You know, you have to cut them and and put them together according to the size you need. And so, that machine right there is is used to lace them to put the pins together so that you can connect your belt. So it fits in the same time in here, but it's not. It's it's not a big honky thing because it's. It's, it's doing uh, less rigorous work, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's just for, like I say, the maintenance of the belts needed to run the machines. And that one there is a relatively uh, newer machine compared to the, you know, the age of this stuff and the rest of the stuff that's in this shop. Okay. Well, we, uh, we cool things. So I guess if Tommy continues out walking here, this is the, the machine shop. We've seen the machine shop uh, maybe a few years back. Uh, that's looking really good, isn't it? Yeah, well, those things are, uh, came to us. Uh, originally, the machine tools on there came out of the uh, Mare Island Naval Shipyard and were used during World War I. Uh, they were then surplused and bought by a gentleman that had a machine shop in the Sacramento area. And his heirs uh, actually donated it to... Uh, to the uh, Amador uh, Sawmill and Mining Association and is one of our restoration projects. And when we got them, they had been outside and were covered with uh, dirt and pretty rusty and debris. And so a lot of time and energy was spent cleaning them up and making them functional again. So uh, they run very nice and it's set up to, to run just as it did. Uh, back in the day, so and that would be typical of anywhere from 1880 to 1920 or so uh, in most shops. So you got a lot of uh, things working off of uh, one single power source. One single power See, that source. was typical of the day, just like the sawmill up here. They had a single power source, whether it be a steam engine or a water wheel, either a Knights or a Pelton wheel. Uh, or later, this one was eventually, uh, originally was off a of steam driven, and then it was uh, in about the 1930s, the guy went to a to electric motor, but as a single electric motor. Modern machines have in each individual machine will have its own power source, but back in the day, that was not the convenience that was available, so they had to run on what they had, what power source they had. So that's where all these belts and pulleys and all those shafts come from. It's just yeah. fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of soothing. It'll put you to sleep if you sit here. It's <laughs> it does have a hypnotic effect to it, doesn't it? But just beautiful, beautiful lathe, and uh, that's the the one I believe. So the lathe is the long one in the yeah. center, what is standing? and that little standing one down there in front of Dave is a is a horizontal milling machine, okay. and up on the other side is a post drill press, and uh, then there's a grinder in here behind this sign. So. Uh, it's like I say, it has most of the tools that you'd find uh, in that uh, period shop. Well, that's fascinating. You have it on this uh, great trailer. Do you, do you take this uh, places and show this off? And that's the reason why we built the trailer. This thing, the thing about our organization, everything here is homemade. We build it all. The lumber that went into this uh, shed or our building came off the mill. We mill the lumber, and that's the result. That's how we use it. And. Uh, you know, it's very convenient, and we intend to take it to more shows, uh, particularly shows that have some historical uh, connection with this kind of thing. You know, I think maybe uh, several years ago when I was talking with you, you were I had plans to maybe put something in a uh, in a tractor trailer in the trailer part and take it to schools and things like that. Oh, well, right. Did anything we can, come we of can that? We do that with this, but what we are doing now is we restore machine tools that are relevant that are that are uh, 
uh, would be common today or have been common over the last 25 years or so. We get those machines either donated or they come from various uh, places, but we restore them and we put them back into some schools. And the reason is, is that uh, we want to make sure that we still have some youngsters have the opportunity to have this experience. You know, ultimately they may want to become machinists well, what or engineers. from the youngsters? What are, they, what are their comments to you? Well, this is new and novel to them uh, because lo most of our schools have closed these kind of programs down. But, I guess it would look uh, new. Oh, yeah, because it's not, uh, it, it, like I said, it's something that they don't have anymore. I just have to take a moment Tommy and uh, take, so just whip pan into that little that little tractor going by there this way cool every, every you've got to come down to the fair because there's side candy all over the place back here and uh, uh, in this old mechanical part of the fair. We, we have what looks like a much more modern piece of equipment over here that we've just restored and we're going to actually market it uh, to help uh, with our nonprofit organization but uh, and it's uh, it was a 1948 vintage machine, and so you can see the difference between it and that one up there. Vintage. That's relatively new. That's two years newer than me. Yeah, that's right there. So, but anyway, we uh, you know, we do a lot of those uh, the kinds of machines that we restore, put back into schools, or make available. You know, the things that we use, the machines we use to work on this or make parts for these are much more modern than the uh, ones we have here at the show. Okay, we're going to maybe have uh, Tommy Pan over to your buddy that's up there uh, with him. And uh, what, what's his name? What's that guy's name? That's, that's Dave. Okay. And Dave does, uh, he's been with the organization for a very long time. Okay, and we're going to have to thank Ed because, uh, or, or Dave, because he, uh, he he turned the machinery on up yeah. there and got that belt working yeah, for absolutely. us. Absolutely. So it's not fascinating if it's not moving. That's right. Absolutely. We love to turn it on. It, it functions. Actually, we make chips with it. So <laughs> they work. Okay. I love it. Thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, all the, you know, just your love of this. It's like, it's, it's just fascinating. Thanks again. You bet. And here's the mine exhibit at the uh, Amador County Fair as well. It's just uh, another thing. And all these things are really close together. So we get back here and it, it's... Like I said, it's fascinating. I think you'd probably hear it in my passion coming through here now. And that mine is uh, really wonderful. They actually have a pit down there. They, I think they drop ore in it after they have uh, dug it. Then there's somebody down in there. They put it in, uh, in one of the loaders. It comes on up to the top, drops on through, goes on into the stamp uh, mill that's over there. I think, it's a, I think it's a tin stamp, if I remember right. It gets crushed. The ore comes on down, down in through the table down here. And... And uh, it's, it's a great thing to watch when it's working. It's just a great thing to see when it's not. So a lot of the times you see some of these head frames, they're not from, you know, uh, they're probably not from a mine exactly like this, uh, but, but you get the idea, you know, like uh, on all of our history. And of course, right here we're standing in Plymouth, and Plymouth had, uh, uh, it took out quite a lot of uh, gold, here it had, it had it certainly had its share of mines. I love the sound of that, and I think sometime I, uh, I maybe even this year, maybe I ought to just uh, put the camera there and uh, get about two or three hours of that sound and put that on the internet. And believe me, uh, people would probably download that who have trouble falling asleep. <laughs> that would put you to sleep like a like a train ride or uh, or rain falling on a canvas tent or a. Or a aluminum uh, ceiling uh, on, on, a, on a tent as well. Believe me, I've spent a few nights listening to stuff like that. So, just beautiful down here, the uh, the old part and that, and this is uh, uh, Robert Manasero's uh, father helped put this part into the Amador County Fair. So glad he did, so glad uh, that, that this is here. You know, when you first come here, some of the first times I we went through the fair, I thought, oh, this is, this is pretty neat and it's way cool. And it was kind of like that, but the longer I stay here, the more the more I appreciate this part of the fair. It's just, uh, it's fantastic. And to think that all these people that have these things come down here and just want to share their love for these, park them, sit around and, and talk and just listen to the noise and, and the smells around these uh these old machines
say uh, goodbye from this part, and this is at Soda Creek's Fire History Project, and I'm sure, uh, well, I shouldn't say, but I, I bank on it. Yeah, well, here's that router right here in this this picture, and of course, a lot of this stuff is down in Amador City. This uh, this particular project, and uh, we were down there just a gosh, maybe a month and a half ago for their uh, 100th anniversary, and. Uh, one more time, I'm throwing too many ands in, but there's so many, so many thoughts that you want to string together down here. So just come on down, spend the time, and you won't have to listen to my, and here's another thought. <laughs> but anyway, I well, hope you enjoyed uh, Tom Slavik's coverage of the Amador County Fair on Sunday. It's just a beautiful time, and this was one of the, my favorite days at the fair. The temperature is just delicious. And so for Tommy Fox, is on camera, and once again myself, Tom Slavik with TSPN TV. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time.